Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. A um, few things I have to say. One is we personally are involved both as a lifestyle, a ketogenic diet, but also through my 16 years of clinical practice of what is effective. What do people need to take sometimes, all the time, to support their ketogenic diet? You'll get bits and pieces of this ongoing week after week. It's important to be comprehensive. In one way, it's simple. and one way, it's a little bit complicated. Hey, everybody. Welcome back for another episode of The Keto Naturopath. This is Dr. Carl Goldkamp. Today, I'm very excited to interview yet another person. This person is self-proclaimed knight errant for diabetes. So what does that mean? We'll get back to that. What I think I would like to say before I say anything about that is that this person has an extraordinary life story, uh, extraordinary life currently. It's not behind him, but he's foreign language trained for the military services. He'll correct whatever I say, at least in uh, three languages, two languages trained in. And I think he speaks another two. He was a med tech before he was a physician. That says something. Then he became a physician, uh, then became a, uh, I think it was a battalion surgeon, at least a couple tours in Iraq. Anyway, so what does that have to do with keto anything? Well, the reason it has to do with keto anything will be his story today. And part of his story is that he, towards the end of his career, his physician career, I don't think if physicians really die, they're like Marines, they just start smelling funny, I guess is the answer, is that he applied it to himself. And so it's his own story being extracted that goes on to being applied to others. This is what Dr. Paul Mambury is about. Welcome, Paul. Hey, thanks a lot, Carl. I appreciate this opportunity. Of course, you know, my message is uh, that there's a terrible epidemic in the world today, and it's primarily caused by refined sugar and to a much lesser extent uh, uh, overindulgence in alcohol. Both can lead to the same thing, which is insulin resistance. And right now in our country, uh, two-thirds of the people are either diabetic or pre-diabetic, and it's very similar in other developed countries. So I found, because I was also uh, insulin resistant and pre-diabetic and weighed 300 pounds, I found that using a ketogenic type diet, uh, you can reverse all these problems. Your blood sugars can become normal. The weight goes away and uh, you you feel great. You have tremendous energy. And that's, uh, I just want to share this with everybody. Of course, for the 26 years I was in practice, I didn't find this till the last year I was in practice. And then I was doing uh, uh, evaluations of injured troops at Fort Drum, New York, and I didn't have much chance to to use it in clinical practice other than on myself. But uh, since I retired, I've uh, perfected my own approach to it. And I try to share that with everybody. I don't want to go back to practicing medicine because frankly, I it, I would probably have to start my own practice. At least that was what I thought at the time I retired because I couldn't fit into a typical HMO or hospital owned large doctor group. And I really uh, wanted to retire and do some of the things I've been looking to do, like travel and uh, read audio books and work on my piano skills and uh, play more tennis. So I just said, well, I, I'll get into podcasting and uh, I'll get into uh, well, no, I haven't podcast well just like this, but uh, into blogging and have a Facebook group and try to help as many people as I can. Let me interject. Your blog is is very impressive. I it's one that, and you can spot a good blog from one that's not. You put a lot of personal time into a particular topic, and so these topics are self chosen. They're not trendy. I mean, it's within the field. It's the points that you feel are very important. Uh, one in particular, and, and maybe we can dig a little bit on that. So it's called borntoeatmeat.com is the blog. Definitely should look it up. I, I like the way Paul writes, and he punctuates it with good pictures as well. And he has a Facebook group called Zero Carb. That on that particular blog that you're digging into the roots of Zero Carb, which is really a form of keto that you are doing now. So two questions I want to ask is that, when you first heard of keto, wasn't there this window of skepticism that's saying, you know, how could things be so different? You know, you weren't just born yesterday. You're not an unintelligent person. You're certainly not an untraveled person. And how could something more or less this simple be so dramatic? Don't have to answer that yet. And then how did you go from implementing what you knew then to saying, I think I'm going to cross over to this zero carb aspect? And maybe you can elaborate. Will you do that? 
Oh, absolutely. I'm glad to. You know, I think one of the reasons that more doctors don't embrace a ketogenic diet is because they're just so stressed out. Since I became a doctor, what's happened is doctors are expected to see ever more patients per hour. When I first started, it was usually just two to three patients an hour. And now uh, a doctor is expected to see six or even more patients per hour. They're normally given uh, six 10-minute slots. And uh, if it's a brand new patient that they've never seen before, they get two slots, 20 minutes. But uh, if it's an established patient, and you know, my, I have lots of friends who are family medicine doctors and other kinds of doctors. And what they tell me is that they basically have to tell the patients, hey, uh, you know, I know you've got a lot of problems you want to talk about today, but pick out the one that's bothering you the most. And we'll talk about that. And I'll set you up an appointment real soon to talk about the others. That's literally what they have to do. Hmm. And so, you know, it's just not very much fun. The other thing that happened uh, was in my career was I think it was probably right around the mid 90s to the late 90s, they brought in the electronic medical record. Well, when I first started in medicine, uh, doctors kept really short notes. I remember one note from the emergency room that I saw where they called in a neurologist uh, to check out a child who had fallen off a slide and hit his head. He didn't pass out, okay? So anyway, the, the, the note from the neurologist was, child fell down and bumped his head, uh, enough said. <laughs> and he signed his name. <laughs> so, you know, this is the kind of records that <laughs> that people used to keep. You know, uh, it would just be a little chicken stretch, uh, you know, uh, up for a note. And then uh, what happened was the uh, HMO insurance model came in and they didn't want to pay, you know, for a full visit for somebody who wrote, child fell down and bumped his head, okay? <laughs> so so they started saying, okay, you've got four levels of visits, and in order to qualify for a level one visit, you can say child bumped his head, but we're not going to pay very much at all for that. A level two visit, the the, the uh, you basically uh, have to recommend some sort of a treatment and document examining two body systems. And there are all these rules. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then the level three, you actually have to make a, a intervention that's dangerous, like a prescription medication or some sort of a procedure or interpret something like an EKG. So it, it, it was got to be a big game where – uh, in the it, this all happened probably in the the mid 80s where doctors had to uh, spend all this time documenting enough to make bring it up to a level three and uh, since more and more physicians have become employed okay they're evaluated on their average level of visit so they had to do all this documentation to basically get a three instead of a two it took them three or four minutes of just writing. And then came the electronic medical record and studies, there have been several studies that I've seen that showed it increased the time the average doctor spent documenting a visit by 50%. Mm. Okay. So as this documentation has gotten more demanding, mm -hmm. doctors get to spend less and less time with their patients. And it's also very taxing on the attention, I guess. It's not very much fun to do it, in my opinion, okay? And uh, I think doctors should be allowed to write down what they think is important and what they think other doctors would need to know. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't have to document, oh, he had a normal throat, he had a normal lung sounds, he had a normal heart rhythm, okay? You shouldn't have to document negatives. You should just document what you found that was abnormal. You know? Right. But, but anyway, uh, that's not the way it is. Also, the doctors, when, every time they get a patient in now, uh, it's like, you know, nowadays, whenever you check into a medical office, they're going to ask you, has your phone number changed? Has your address changed? Well, the doctor is responsible. Now, uh, sometimes the nurses can help with this, but, you know, are you up to date on your pneumonia shot? Have you had your cholesterol checked? That's, that's always a big one, you know. Right, right, right. <laughs> and uh, uh, all this kind of stuff. And if you actually... The, they've got it down now with the computers to where if you 
check the cholesterol and it was high and you didn't prescribe a statin, you actually can lose points. Mm. And those points are used to calculate who are the best doctors. Mm. And also in many HMO systems, they're, they're used to calculate bonus payments. So in wow. other words, you don't, you don't get bonus payments if you don't have your, your, all your patients taking a statin. So you wonder why your doctors are so mm. anxious to get you a statin, okay? Uh, so to, that, let me ask the obvious, though. I mean, so it, it sounds to the the outside listener like we're saying, well, I mean, obviously there's a financial interest. Doctors need to get their numbers up so they can get a good income. I totally buy that, and and yeah. I feel badly for the doctors. The statin part, do you feel that is just you know a big pharma coming in saying you know we're making this relationship with hospitals now, and you got to sell our stuff, otherwise we're going to go someplace else. I mean, do you think it's that sort of intimate between? a statin and the company that makes the statin and the uh, charting of, the recording of, uh, the following of a doctor, whether they uh, prescribe it or not? Or do you feel that, no, it's uh, documented health reasons that uh, everybody needs to be on a statin that has elevated cholesterol? It's not as financially motivated. It's more health motivated. What's your, your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts on that are, you know, I actually listened to a little short 18-minute video where they where they interviewed the author of The Big Fat Surprise, Nina Teicholz. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, she started uh, a the Nutrition Coalition, which is basically a lobbying organization in Washington, D.C. And her point was that government guidelines have most likely caused more problems than most of the things in the healthcare system because um, – uh, they're based on bad science, basically observational science. And they, you know, but she was talking about how pervasive they are. And uh, among the other things is, uh, you know, 57 million people or something like that uh, are on government food assistance in the United States. It controls mm -hmm. what's served at school lunches. It's conserved what's, uh, it's controls what's served in the military. It controls what's served in hospitals. And uh, I think that those same government guidelines, the National Health Center, about cholesterol have affected these HMOs to, to swing towards this. They're saying, well, we want to do things that are going to save us money. And if we prevent people from having heart disease, that's going to save us money. So we need to follow these government guidelines on cholesterol and treating it. And I, I, I think that's where it came from. Okay, so at least it's health motivated, even though based on faulty information, as opposed to being financially motivated, and it's a whole different route. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I actually think that, and I, I think, but I think that the it is in the long run financially motivated uh, because the pharmaceutical companies pay large sums, uh, both in ter direct payments and in support of research, for these uh, doctors that make the guidelines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I agree. I the, agree. The, 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 the guidelines are not unbiased. OK. And the uh, the pharmaceutical industry controls what's published, which which trials get published. And so, for instance, um, as a couple examples just come to mind, as Dr. Fung published the other day, that the average peer reviewer, the people who decide what article goes into a journal, they're called peer reviewers, the average peer reviewer on a cardiology journal is paid $530,000 in direct and research support payments. Okay. Mm. Now, the ones for other journals are much lower. They're around $100,000, $150,000. But the um, still, they're getting a lot of money and you know, they're going to have to think twice about what articles they allow into the yep. journals. And the, the other thing that he, he pointed out was that uh, in the prior year, there had been something like uh, 38 studies about the effectiveness of antidepressive medications. And mm. it said that 16 were negative and four showed, you know, not much effect or whatever. And, uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, 16 positive ones all got got published, and only one of the ones that showed no benefit uh, got published. That's interesting. Yeah. It's kind of like the, the Norm Chomsky manufacturing consent in a different context. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, so uh, that's why I think these things are, are going on. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I just, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult landscape out there for, for doctors. And I, I would not be very comfortable practicing. And of course, another thing I, I saw in the paper was that last year was the first year that over half of doctors were employed physicians. They were working for a hospital or somebody else or a large HMO. Mm. And so that's, uh, that's uh, 51% last year of, mm. do- of, of, of doctors. So, hey, you know, what can you do? Yeah. Um, but, you know, we can try to get the word out there. And I think that because there's not much money to be made by telling people to eat a ketogenic diet, I think that it's going to be very difficult difficult to get the word out there. The only way I think is just by word of mouth through the internet. And that's incredibly powerful. And that's what I'm trying to help with. And you are too, obviously. Yeah. So, so Paul, back when you were transitioning out of medicine generally, and you're, you're either through your own readings or or were introduced to the ketogenic diet by somebody else. At what point did you go from skeptical to, you don't think I'm going to try this? And did you want to try this privately so nobody would know? Or do you go, you know, I'm throwing myself into it because what that that what was in your mind there? What made that disturbance? Because clearly it's, it was a path not taken and you took it. You know, it's very interesting. I had had a few patients who had told me they had had success with Atkins style diets. <laughs> and I had always said, well, you know, there's so many, uh, you know, all my other doctor friends and at all the conferences I go to, they say that, you know, Atkins is not sustainable. Atkins is dangerous. It's going to raise heart disease, you know, yada, yada. You've, you've heard Mm -hmm. all those things. I don't have to tell you, Mm -hmm. but, um, so I frankly, and that's where we get back to what I said. I think the problem is doctor burnout. Okay. Mm -hmm. Doctors don't go home in the evenings and and read journals, most of them. <laughs> I tell you, I'm I'm sorry, but you know, I know a lot of doctors, and I know very few who go home and pick up a journal. Okay, uh, so uh, I mean, there are some. Certainly, yeah. there are some. But then, even if they do, the stuff that's in the major journals has been filtered through the uh, pharmaceutical industry controllers. Yeah. yeah. So uh, they're not going to find. And very few of them have time to explore what they call kooky fringe ideas. Mm-hmm. You know, if they're, if they're going to pick up a journal, they're going to pick up JAMA or they're going to, you know, mm-hmm. a, a Journal of the American Family Practice Association or something like that. But anyway, um, what I what I wanted to say was that uh, I think that that burnout is one of the reasons that doctors, you know, just don't get it. And then the fact that they're so controlled, because where do doctors get their required continuing medical education? Hmm. Well, I'll tell you where they get those conti- their required continual education. They get it from the pharmaceutical companies, because hmm. the pharmaceutical representatives in their area, uh, pretty much when I was in practice. Now, I don't know how it is right now, because I haven't practiced in five years. I understand maybe they're cl- clamping down on some of this stuff. But right up until I finished my practice in 2012, was the last year I practiced, the pharmaceutical reps, even in small towns uh, like Albany or, you know, Watertown where I was, would have dinners for the doctors. And so what a typical dinner is, okay, they pay a local cardiologist or a local neurologist or a local endocrinologist, you know, that has a good reputation. They give him between five hundred and a thousand dollars. You come to this dinner. You get there around seven or so, or six. You know, no, usually what it is, it's like six thirty. They have they start the open bar. They have open bar for an hour, <laughs> and and it's you know it's it's you get whatever drink you want, and you go there, and then from six thirty to seven thirty, you kind of uh, chit chat with all your fellow doctors, and you get to know them, you know, and. You know, you talk about when you're going to play golf next and mm-hmm. you know, those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. And, and then you, you go into the to the uh, dining room and everybody sits at a table. And it used to be up until, gosh, I want to say up until like 2000 and uh, maybe uh, 2005, 2006, 
uh, that you could bring your wife. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then they stopped that. You couldn't bring your wife anywhere, but they still had the, uh, the open bar and everything after that. So they would give you dinner. And then, uh, while you were eating, uh, Dr. Smith, uh, the local cardiologist would get up there and tell you, uh, why Crestor was an incredible statin and how many lives you were going to save by giving your patients Crestor, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. and here's how it works. And, Here's our wonderful studies, you know, right, right. And, and 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 you get one hour of CME mm. for that. OK. And then uh, they have uh, retreats where they tell you like Pfizer. I've been to several of them. Pfizer weekends. They would take you to a resort <laughs> and where, and you'd get a free round of golf, you know, or <laughs> uh, or whatever. And they put you up in a condominium. And then during the day, you'd have like four or five hours of lectures about why their blood pressure medicines were the best blood pressure medicines, why their statins were the best statins, you know. Mm -hmm. So so that's where doctors tend to get their information. Their yeah. information. Back in the old days and like before, they had something, I think it was in uh, 2006 that they, they cut back on a lot of the excesses that they used to do. But before that, they would do things like uh, – uh, from Albany, New York, they'd put me on on a bus and drive me to New York City. They, we start out in the bus in the morning. OK, we went and had like a, a two hour lecture on some drug that they wanted. OK, mm -hmm. and then they uh, took us to uh, Yankee Stadium and brought us nice tickets, and we we watched the Yankees play. <laughs> and, and, and and then after that, they took us to a Brazilian churrascaria restaurant, and then they drove us back home on the bus, and it was a whole day out. Wow. You know? wow. Uh, uh, if you like to play golf, they were always having golf days where you would go and you would listen to a lecture, have a nice lunch, and then they'd have like a thing where the shotgun – I'm not a big golfer, you know, hmm. but uh, – uh, I would do it occasionally because I had a good buddy who was a family practice doctor also that I like to that I like to visit with. And uh, he liked to play golf. So I'd go with him <laughs> and uh, try to do it. But it's uh, it, you know, that's the culture yep. that we're coming from. And it's it's kind of incestuous, you know, yep, <laughs> the relationship right. between the doctors and the uh, pharmaceutical industry. So, uh, so did you. Did you, in essence, break out of that because you were headed towards, you know, stopping your practice, headed towards a retirement from medicine, and therefore uh, you were a little more open-minded? Or were you, what went off in your mind to... Well, yeah, you know, here's what went off in my personal mind, okay? I have always struggled with my weight because I've had the metabolic, you know, well, first of all, I'm, uh, I've always been addicted to sugar. I, I overate sugar for, you know, 60 years, basically. I, uh, I actually think I started when I'm 67 years old now and I didn't start low carb. I didn't start Atkins till I was 61 years old. That's what, six years ago, mm -hmm. six, six, almost seven. But, uh, the reason I say I've been a sugar addict all my life was my mother got some really great advice from her doctor. She said that she, instead of breastfeeding, that it's much more sanitary and much more healthy for the baby to raise them on formula. Ah. And, and I was what, the, and I've, I, I've got pictures of the ads. If you go to Google images and type in carnation baby, they had a big ad campaign, make your baby a carnation baby. And it was carnation uh, condensed milk, which is very high in, um, mm -hmm. uh, very high in lactose because it's condensed. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's very sweet. And then what you would do is you would take that and you would mix it with a uh, Cairo syrup, mm. <laughs> mm. which, you know, is, is just a syrup. You know, so you would actually dilute it with sugar water. Amazing. Okay. And that was what I was fed as a baby. <laughs> so, so you, you know, I, I started my sugar addiction young. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you're pre set up for that, predetermined. Yeah, exactly. So, so anyway, I finally, you know, in my practice, you know, 26 years, I had a lot as a family medicine physician. I had a lot of diabetic uh, and obese patients, and I 
never really managed to help any of them. I mean, I thought I was because I could get their A1Cs down. But I, for everyone who doesn't know what an A1C is, an A1C measures what your average sugar level has been for the last three months or so. And it's a good indication of whether you're going to get the complications of diabetes or not. Okay. So uh, doctors are able to delay the complications of diabetes by getting A1C down using all kinds of pills and in insulin injections. And, uh, but uh, it doesn't reverse the obesity. And, you know, obesity just in, its, in and of itself is disabling for a lot of people. And also the, the pills and insulin that we use, a lot of those uh, actually cause the patients to get even fatter. So you give somebody insulin, they're going to get fat. It's just you give anybody insulin, they're going to get fat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so so um, they were basically temporizing measures at, that just slowed down the progression of the disease a little bit. Right. And I always would, you know, I always thought maybe it should be curable. But I was told by everybody that, no, all you can do is all you can hope to do is slow it down. Mm. And that's why I consider myself uh, a, a knight errant against diabetes is because I finally found out after lots of study that it's totally reversible. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and, and, and for all those years, I feel so guilty that I didn't investigate then or didn't somehow find out this. Uh, I, I, th I think that it's easier for a doctor now because there's some really good studies showing that you can reverse it. Uh, the, the Virta people yep. at the University of Indiana uh, are doing wonderful, wonderful work. Sarah, um, oh gosh, what's her na last name? Uh, but uh, um, Right. She's a CMO and Steve Finney and yeah. Jeff Fulick, you bet. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so they're they're doing tremendous work showing you know how you can reverse diabetes uh, with a ketogenic diet. Right, and they're doing and, it in an irrefutable way. It's not going to be some little study. It's a huge study, but yeah, a study exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, exactly. So you know the 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 death knell for the standard treatment of diabetes in the United States has been sounded and is getting louder, but. It's getting louder much too slowly, in my opinion. So I'm trying to help that. Nice, nice. I hear that. Um, <clears throat> did you read uh, Coyote, or are you just borrowing that term? <laughs> you, know? No, you know, actually, um, I was going to be a Spanish high school teacher when I was uh, when I first got out of the Navy after my first stint. Right. And uh, I actually have I I changed my mind because my mother developed cancer because of her metabolic syndrome. It's throughout my family, but. But the short short answer is, I actually read Don Quixote in the original language, and I have a degree in Spanish literature. Oh but I changed my major and all, and got a double major in uh, Spanish literature and biology from University of Houston. Then went to University of Texas uh, Health Science Center at Houston, did my medical technology degree, my BS in medical technology, and then went to University of Texas Medical Branch and did my medical school degree. Nice, nice. I remember reading yeah. that. And you're trained in Russian. Yeah. Let's throw that in, but that's another yeah. little <laughs> dog, <laughs> yeah. dog leg. So, all right. Mm -hmm. Now I understand your perspective, and uh, I appreciate that a lot. So how did you move from the keto world from the Atkins way of doing things, which is a more or less nearly a classic, uh, the classic ketogenic diet to a zero carb. So well, go ahead. there's a couple of things so basically I stalled. I, I, when I first began a ketogenic diet, I bought, uh, uh, Eric Westman and Steve Finney's book, uh, a, it's the new Atkins for a new you, mm -hmm. I believe is the title of it. And I followed it. And what I found was that um, throughout my life, I had been up as high as about 300 pounds. And I, with that diet, had managed fairly effortlessly uh, to get myself down to around 220 pounds. Now, I had been down to 220 pounds many times. And the way I used to do it, and it got harder and harder, was basically to calorie restrict myself and become an exercise bulimic. I would run 40, 50 miles a week and, and eat very small, uh, low fat, 
meals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I would count, count my calories and you can do it that way, but it got harder and harder to do it that way. And it's the only reason I did it was because again, I had most of my life I spent in military service. I, I was a Navy doctor for nine and a half years. I got out and then in uh, May of 2001, uh, some buddies convinced me to join the National Guard, the Army National Guard. They said, hey, it's one weekend a month and two weekends, two weeks in the summer, and all we do is set up tents and play with <laughs> compasses. <laughs> they said, it's like the Boy Scouts, you know? And uh, so anyway, uh, uh, I joined, and in 2000, you know, in September of that same year, you know, oh, the, war, the war started. Yep. And I basically just... Uh, decided, you know, hey, I've got 13 and a half years of active service. And so I went on as much active duty as I possibly could find. And, and actually, in the, the final two years, just went uh, active, active duty army mm -hmm. up at uh, Fort Drummond. And uh, it managed to get a, uh, I managed to get put together 20 years of active service, uh, 26 years for pay. And it's given me a good enough, and also because uh, as soon as the war started, all the old doctors in the Army National Guard that had the high ranks, mm -hmm. they they retired <laughs> quickly, <laughs> and and so I shot up from from major to full bird colonel in just <laughs> seven years. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing because uh, the path was totally cleared above me. <laughs> okay, so going forward from there, how did you go to the the, the zero carb because. That's a lot of thoughtfulness. And so what, what did that cross? Because now, and when would you say you actually started um, your ketogenic, you, were, you, were, you would call yourself on a ketogenic diet? Well, I think that the Atkins can be a ketogenic diet, mm -hmm. okay? But I really think that, okay, you, you, how much you have to control your diet to be ketogenic is different uh, for someone who is insulin resistant than it is for somebody who's not insulin resistant. And the more insulin resistant you are, the more you have to control your carbohydrate and uh, protein intake. Okay. And uh, I've got really nice, uh, Dr. S uh, Stephen Finney and Volick both got together and published an, uh, an article that I can, uh, it was a blog post, it's actually a Virta blog post mm -hmm. that I can send you, it was titled, How Much Protein Do You Need? Yep. Okay, where they, they point out that the more insulin resistant you are, the lower you have to keep your protein, okay? And mm -hmm. they came out and said that in the article. So, um, uh, basically, I evidently have an addictive eating nature. I know I'm addicted to sugar. Mm -hmm. And... I, you know, any kind of low carb sweets, I would overeat them because I would just lose control. Right. And the other thing I found that I was overeating a lot of the s supposedly low carb vegetables, uh, spaghetti squash, just uh, seven uh, net carbs for a cup. Well, I can easily eat three or four cups. No yeah. problem there. I'm a big guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would just be one meal. And then let's say uh, I ordered a, a wheat-free market wheat belly pizza, and that's uh, the package uh, makes two 10-inch uh, crusts, okay? And uh, each, uh, so there are six servings, and each serving is just seven net carbs again, okay? Mm -hmm. But then that means for the whole package, it's 42 carbs. Now, I can eat one of those little 10-inch pizzas, no problem. That's 21 carbs right there. Okay, and uh, then once you start putting uh, some kind of tomato sauce on it, it's you're adding a few more carbs at the least, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, there were there were other oh, uh, don't even talk about avocados <laughs> at, at at fifteen grams of carbohydrate yep. an avocado. Yep. Well, I I think personally that I am so insulin resistant because of the damage I've done so insulin resistant because of the damage I've done to my liver with all the sugar I ate through the years, mm -hmm. that basically the fructose I ate through the years, that I really need to keep my carbs under 20 grams a day, okay? Right. And I, I, I'm I, with Dr. Eric Westman, okay, on mm -hmm. this. I don't believe in net carbs, okay? Good. Good. I, I think that 
probably that with fiber, you, uh, you know, say uh, 10 grams of, of, um, of fiber probably counts more like three or four carbs. Mm -hmm. That's just my guess. But some of it is going to get broken down and count as carbs to, in my, my, my opinion. So uh, Dr. Westman always says he, he, uses, he doesn't believe in net carbs either. And he says that uh, total carbs and counting total carbs is the doctor's strength of the medicine, while uh, net carbs is the over-the-counter strength. Okay. That's a, that's a, so I want to do the doctor strength. I'm, I'm sick enough. I need the doctor strength. Okay. That's great. And uh, yeah, so, so anyway, the, I actually realized I was a sugar addict. Uh, it actually was July the 13th, and it was uh, actually 2013 that I finally realized – that I could not control it with sweets. And at that point, uh, and I can look at my phone here just for a second as I keep it on there, uh, that was uh, 1,415 days ago. Okay? Wow. And I decided I would not put intentionally put anything sweet in my mouth ever again. Yeah. And I've kept to that. And so that, I think that was one of the best decisions I made. Well, clearly, okay? clearly. But, but, but then avocados and spaghetti squash and... Uh, uh, wheat belly pizzas aren't sweet. Right. Okay. So, uh, there was a problem there and I could not control myself with those things. So for people who have an addictive component to their eating, and I think a lot of people are do, and I think a lot of people don't, I think a lot of people can, you know, just have one or two slices of the wheat belly pizza and be fine. And, but for the people that, have an addictive component to their eating, I think that uh, zero carb is the only real way to total abstinence from carbs. Okay. It's yeah, yeah. So so it's it's basically, in my opinion, a wonderful thing for people that uh, um, that can't have similar problems to myself and controlling themselves with the low carb foods. Now, uh, I think it's perfectly healthy because I think we have lots of cultures that we can look to, like the coastal Inuits, the Sib Siberian Ninnits, the Maasai in Kenya, that basically eat almost no plant material and are quite healthy. So yeah. I think it's a perfectly healthy way to eat. Uh, and also now we have some good evidence that uh, plant foods are – that – we may be able to treat a lot of autoimmune conditions if we eliminate plant foods from our diet. And this work's being done in Hungary, as you probably know, by Dr. Yeah. Sophia Clemens. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's another reason people might want to consider zero carb. I'm not here to say that zero carb is the absolute best way for everybody to eat. That's not what I'm about. Uh, and uh, I, in my Facebook group, I welcome people who are all kinds of mm -hmm. on all kinds of low carb diets or keto diets or whatever. I, I like to discuss the science, and uh, you know, absolutely. No, even you, you you play a major role. You influence me, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But let me throw you a curveball in terms of, uh, and I like the way that you led into zero carbs for, for those who have an addictive component to their eating habits. Zero carb is probably the best way to go. I I wasn't expecting that, and I think that's very insightful. Here's my question to you. What, what's your take on dairy? And so, you know, mm -hmm. dairy is all from cow milk, but people go, well, there's milk. I don't drink milk anymore. I love cheese. And we mm -hmm. know that pizza is the most addicting food by what, two universities, Yale and, and Michigan, both did different studies on that in the last uh, couple of years anyway. What's your take on it? Where do you, what, where do you see dairy? Well, you know, um, I personally don't consider cheese as dairy. I consider it as a fermented food. Yeah. Huh. So um, uh, I would not – I don't use milk. I don't use heavy whipping cream. I don't use uh, half and half. Uh, but I do eat a lot of cheese. <laughs> and the reason I, I think that it's perfectly okay, okay, is one, I, uh, I think that the other thing that people who are very insulin resistant need to do is to limit their protein – to no more than 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram of weight they think they should weigh per day. Mm -hmm. And I think that 
the best way to do that that I found, uh, and I found it so effective in so many people that, that have tried it, is to try to get 70 to 80 percent of their calories from fat. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, cheese, uh, depending on which cheese you're you're talking, uh, m- most aged cheeses are around 60 to 70 percent fat calories. Mm-hmm. So it it's it's a winner right there for me as a food. Okay, I don't like any kind of f- a cheese that's made from low fat milk or or something like that, but you know. A good fatty cheese yep. is what I what I try to find. Yep. And then you take uh, I uh, you you'd say okay. I hear people tell me that you don't uh, that our hunter gatherer ancestors didn't chase around cows and try to milk them. Uh, yada mm-hmm. yada. Yeah. But uh, the the fact remains that before say two or three hundred years ago, yeah, pretty much uh, every child that was ever born uh, was uh, was on dairy for the first year of their life, either from their mother or maybe from a cow or a goat or yeah. a sheep. They might they might have done that, but uh, you know. And there is really not that much difference between uh, the proteins in cow milk and the proteins in human milk. It's it's not like they're from a different planet, you know. No. They're they're very similar. To, to our proteins. Let me, Jack, because so I'm a naturopathic mm-hmm. physician and I'm, I'm no yeah. longer practicing as well. But the yeah. number one thing, looking back on, I practiced clinically about 17 uh-huh. years, um, is the number one thing I would tell an incoming physician saying, you know, you can forget mm-hmm. all your science and forget, just be a nice person and interface with your patients and have them all get off of dairy and they're all going to come back and, and feel wonderful. I mean, it was just looking backwards. That was the single thing that was the highest in the list, not the supplements, not the blood work, not the, you know, the, the environmental toxins. And so I've been working on going deeper with dairy. I mean, it's, as a physician, you don't have the time. You do the yeah. thing that's going to make the difference. And, you know, that's... Yeah. And so one's not understanding, but it's taking action, which is different mm-hmm. than a researcher. And so what I've come up with so far, and it's you know, pretty much out there, is that how the protein, the casein... So in human mm-hmm. milk, and you brought up human milk. So the protein in human milk is is whey and casein, of course. It's with all mammals, actually. Yes. But, but the ratio of 100% of the protein in, in breast milk, 20% is casein and 80% is whey. It's kind of like a fast protein and a slow protein. And you go to cow, for one, it's a, it's a lot more, obviously. It's a bigger animal. But 80% of that protein is casein and, the, and 20% is whey. But the other thing is when casein is broken down, this whole thing of the, the casomorphines, you know, that little... Mm-hmm. It's basically a string of peptides and they, they're they all called something different. And so on a per mammal species that little and that happens in your stomach and so mm-hmm. when that little piece of uh, casomorphine breaks down it, it 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 is an opiate it does react to the opiate receptors and it provides the bonding of mother child but the strength the drive the potency of that opiate is far stronger in a cow yet the cow casomorphine is a lot stronger than it is for the in the human casomorphine. So they both have casomorphines. One is a lot far fewer because there's less casein for it to break, to digest. And in the cow, it's a lot more, but the potency of it is far greater to drive that, to use your words of other kinds of foods, that addiction to come back to the breast. You know, hey, hey, hey calf, hey, hey, little baby, hey, Bobby, come back to the breast because you're still a growing little mammal. We need to enlarge you. And so I've been dealing with, you know, how is this? Why Why did those affect, why is it true? You know, this is from my experience, so I don't need, I don't need to argue with anybody on that. Say, so why was that true? You know, it clearly couldn't have been placebo. Uh, maybe not clearly, but in my mind, it wasn't placebo. And mm-hmm. and I don't want to be against, I'd rather have a, a, a world full of cows than <clears throat> apartment buildings, whatever else, you know, or... Um, and so that's where I am so far in the, the addiction of, of um, what do you say, the most addictive food is pizza, is what they said, for Yale and Michigan. And they think that it was basically uh, the cheese, but then you have the glutomorphines, which is the wheat, a whole different story. Um, and so that's interesting. You know, I mean, that's that's where I come with that. It's like, what? You know, it's the casein. And besides removing the allergen, um, it was this other drive. And I would guess when, when people have asked me, you know, I've, 
And they go, well, keto's only gotten me so far in weight loss. And I say, well, where, what's your stance on dairy? I said, I love it. I love cheese. I said, if you think you can go without dairy for six weeks, 100%, not like almost, I was, I was nearly, you know, perfect it's for six weeks, ideally two months. I will say that your weight will continue to drop. You know, it's a, uh, and, and I haven't gone into the estrogens, which all mammalian milk has, of course, for good reasons and so on and so forth, or IGF-1 and so on. It gets a pretty sophisticated argument, but just on the casomorphine side of things, um, it's interesting. You know, any thoughts on that? I'm sure you're familiar with these and you've probably put the pieces of information together differently. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I'd say is that uh, I have heard people tell me that they're unable to stop with cheese. Oh, well, I'm... I've never had that problem. But again, you know, some people don't have the problem with the, the avocados or the spaghetti squash that I have. Yeah. I guess we, we all have a tendency, genetic probably, to be addicted to different things. Now, um, I think that there's a couple of things about uh, what you said. One is I think that the whey is the big problem. OK, mm. that's one of the reasons why I don't drink milk or use um, uh, heavy whipping cream or half and half. Is that it? I and I have a study that shows this that one gram of whey uh, protein generates the same amount of insulin as one gram of carbohydrate. Correct. By so, way. so, so uh, you know, to me, uh, you know, when you make cheese, the first thing you do is to to um, clabber the milk mm -hmm. or or and you, to curdle the milk, and uh, then you put it through a uh, cheesecloth and then squeeze the uh, twist the cheesecloth to squeeze all the liquid out and the liquid is the whey right so most of the whey protein is taken out of cheese so the casein is not nearly as insulinogenic so I think that that's a big plus for cheese and the other thing I think and I don't I've looked and looked and looked uh, but frankly uh, I can't uh, I, I can't find any studies on this, but uh, I try to buy cheese that's been aged for at least a year. So what's happened then is the bacteria have basically mm -hmm. been feeding on that on that casein mm -hmm. and and they've been uh, uh, and, and whatever uh, lactose is left in it, but they have to be feeding on and there's not that much lactose left. So they have to be feeding on the protein. And uh, they're, to me, probably converting a lot of that protein, and then they're uh, putting out um, uh, lactic acid. And that lactic acid is basically denaturing the protein. In other words, the protein, the casein, I doubt that, that a lot of the casein in cheese is structurally the same as it was when it first, you know, yep. Uh, yep. the previous year. So I'm, I'm not sure how much of the, that is still converted to caseomorphines. But uh, for me, the acid test is, uh, is it, does it work? And I've never, you know, not eaten cheese during my time. And I will be at my goal weight of around 170. Uh, and uh, I, I'm wearing the exact same size 32 jeans as I did Two August, so it, it'll be two years in August okay, <laughs> that, that I got into size 32 jeans comfortably. That's nice. And, uh, I, you know, before that, when I even when I was starving myself, I never got under 220 pounds. OK, mm -hmm. so that's 50 pounds lighter than I ever was during my military career. Wow. And, yeah. and uh, it's been effortless. And it, the thing that did it was when I started limiting my not only zero carbs, but limiting my protein. And I try to get. I like to get around 1.1, 1.2 grams per kilogram per day. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's worked for me. And so I can eat all that. I don't, I don't limit myself from the meat I eat. The only thing I do is if I eat a meat or something that's less than 70% uh, uh, fat calories, then I add a slice of butter to every bite. So I, when I go to a restaurant, to a steakhouse, to a barbecue restaurant, I carry uh, a stick of butter with me <laughs> and I literally sit there at the table and slice off a small uh, slice of butter and put it on every bite of the, the barbecue brisket or the, uh, you know, or the steak. My, you know, sirloin steaks are really only about, you know, 
high 50s yep. as far as fat calories. I agree. So two questions. Mm. One, facetious. Yeah. How does that butter not melt by the time you get to the restaurant if you've been holding? Oh, I have a, a little bag with the uh, reusable ice things in it that I throw <laughs> it in. And uh, uh, I, I also bring some – I like um, – I drink uh, what's called sparkling seltzer water or carbonated water. Mm-hmm. And so I bring I bring a couple of those. And after a, a big meal, I always enjoy a, a carbonated water. It's just a habit I've developed. Great. But, that, that, that's a good idea. So, um, you know, when people listen to this, they hear the, the one to one and a half grams per kilogram of ideal body weight. Um, uh-huh. I think what they don't hear is that, oh, wait a minute. At some point, I'm going to have to go through the tedium of measuring – I put this steak down, I see how much it weighs, I calculate how much is protein and how much is fat. Mm -hmm. And until you know to eyeball that or to know that ratio, uh, you need to go through that uh, Mm -hmm. way of... So you you obviously went through that, but I just think that people need to hear that, that there's a stage that you had to go through to know how much protein was in a certain steak of a certain weight, and therefore you knew how much, when to stop eating or what was too much for that ratio correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So now I kind of know and, uh, you know, I, I pretty much eat the same foods, you know. Uh, there's not that much variation in my diet, uh, you know, that I eat. And uh, I, I have found pretty much that if you just learn what percent of fat calories a food is in general, you can pretty much eat as much as you want to as long as you add enough fat to it in the form of a butter, I suppose people could, uh, you know, if you're not zero carb, you're not as much limited on on the kind of fat things you can do. One thing that would be very good is if you uh, wanted to put avocado mayonnaise, you know, mm-hmm. May- mayonnaise is very high fat. Right. So you, like, you might want to put mayonnaise on it or there's lots of the French know about adding fat to food. Okay? <laughs> yeah, they do. So, they do. Right. There, there's uh, Bernays sauce, Hollandaise sauce, uh, you know, all these, all these different, uh, uh, and basically they're just farms of butter with a little, you know, flavoring in them. Yeah, no, I agree. So, what are your thoughts of the MCT oil, whether it's C8 or C10? Do you use it, or you sort of see that as a contrivance in your way of eating, and you're, you're happy? Look, you know, you just eat meat, you slap on the and the butter when you need it, and you're good. Is, you know, what's, what's yeah. That, I, I, I've never tried it. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't have a big opinion on it. Um, uh, it's probably fine. You know, it's, uh, I just more of a natural guy. I don't yep. recommend any vitamins, minerals, or supplements to anybody. I appreciate okay? that. Yep. No, I'm with you. And uh, yeah. And so, you know, that's just me. I, I think that as long as you're eating a meat based diet, you're going to get everything you need. But, uh, if, if somebody wants to use MCT oil and, and uh, put it in their bulletproof coffee with butter, I don't see that as a problem at all. Okay. That's good. So let me go back. How you influenced me, by the way, was, um, you're one of the voices in my head that I, because I started reading and started to appreciate your blog because I, I realized there's a thoughtfulness behind your creation of it. And, and of course that would be you once you get to know who you are. Um, but I didn't at the time. And so I read about uh, your, you're actually talking about the origin of zero carb and, and bear and um, uh, I forgot uh, Washington's first name. I want to say. Yeah. Yeah. Charles Washington. Charles yeah. Washington. Right. And they have a Facebook group, but uh, you, and so anyways, that's where, that was one of three voices that came into my mind was your blog. And so I've been a zero carb since last February and I do find it a, a much easier way of life. Um, but I wanted to go and just reveal a little bit of the history that you revealed in that blog because I think it's fascinating. It was such a pre-existing movement that had nothing to do with a group of doctors coming up with a, a you know a long study and therefore we're getting a group of followers. It came from a whole different place. Do you want to just sort of summarize that? I think it was fascinating. Yeah. And- well, I think that in our country, well, there, oh gosh, uh, there were there were people. In our country, uh, I think the first guy that really started off was uh, Viljamar Stefansson, who mm-hmm. was a, a Canadian who he went to uh, Harvard University and got a degree in ethnology, which is kind of like anthropology now. And he went to uh, Alaska and lived with the coastal Inuits on and off for 10 years and ate their diet, lived in their houses and got to know them before they – were influenced by the Western diet, and he found them all to be vigorous, 
healthy, with no problems. And he also would help lead expeditions uh, of uh, scientists from America and Europe into the Arctic. And of course, the big problem back then was scurvy or lack of vitamin C. So he found out that the, the, when the Eskimos would go into the Arctic, they would basically live on seal meat and, uh, and polar bear uh, meat, and they had absolutely no problems with scurvy. But what he saw was when the Europeans are, and Americans would come and they bring all their high-carbohydrate canned foods – uh, and uh, dehydrated breads and things like that, that they had terrible problems uh, mm -hmm. with scurvy. And so uh, uh, he went back to New York City, and the doctors wouldn't believe him. They said, uh, if you do eat all meat, uh, you'd have scurvy in three weeks. So they put him in, uh, the doctors at... Uh, Columbia University put him into the hospital, Belleville Hospital, and they did a year-long experiment where him and a, a fellow Arctic explorer, um, Anderson, uh, ate nothing but meat. And they measured all kinds of lab work on him. And, you know, I, one of my blogs, I think in that blog you're talking about, I, I put a link to the full experiment. Absolutely. And the, re nope. the report. You can still so, find it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And the, um, uh, you know, they didn't get scurvy and they were quite healthy. And so uh, that kind of was the start of the meat movement. Then there were some other doctors who came up with the idea, you know, in the early 1900s, too. And they, they prescribed all meat diets. And I mentioned them in there. Uh, I, I haven't studied them in detail, but they basically, uh, for instance, Dr. Salisbury. OK, mm -hmm. uh, everybody probably heard of Salisbury steak. I think Dr. Salisbury would turn over in his grave now because uh, somebody came up with the idea uh, that you should add breadcrumbs to Salisbury steak. <laughs> and so if you look up if you look up Salisbury steak recipes now, you'll find that, that, that they invariably uh, suggest that you add breadcrumbs to it. But uh, uh, Dr. Salisbury was a pure meat person and, and there have been others. And then, of course, uh, famously the bear – uh, mm -hmm. who is uh, Owsley III, uh, gosh, I can never remember his name, but uh, uh, he was actually the son of a senator from Missouri, I believe, mm -hmm. and he went out to California and became the sound man for the role, uh, for the Grateful Dead, uh, Grateful Dead, and did all these exciting things. And he, uh, during the summer of love with the love ends, Absolutely. he made it, he, he made all the acid for them. There's quite a colorful character, but <laughs> he turned out, he, he, uh, started eating only meat and, and managed to do it for 50 years, evidently yep. fairly successfully. So, um, uh, he was influenced then Charles Washington and a lot of other people, and they started a blog and, and he, uh, Owsley was the first person that I found that actually called coined the term. And it was in his talking in his writings with, uh, with Charles Washington that he called it zero carb. Right. So that's, that's where the zero carb, as far as I know, comes from. Excellent. Excellent. I wanted to follow up on, um, uh, Vilmar Johansson is that he ended up at Dartmouth <clears throat> and he started at what is called the Cold Regions Research uh, Institute, mm -hmm. Corel. And because of his, and that's like the library you go to, to to learn about the Inuits and all of the, even though it's actually a kind of, I won't say paramilitary, it's a, uh, uh, the, the Cold Regions Research Engineering was about uh -huh. what if there was going to be war in the Arctic, you know, and they use his, his expertise, but it, it's now has become the kind of secret library of all the Arctic and Antarctic uh, research of native uh, peoples. So that's where, uh, interesting that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to go there. I know that there's been a lot of doctors who stud also studied the Europe, uh, the, um, sorry, the coastal Inuit, uh, one evidently is from Germany who migrated to Canada and they, they found that the, the, the incidence of cancer and heart disease skyrocketed as soon as the uh, natives would come in contact with the Western style diet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's amazing. It's amazing. 
<laughs> you know what I saw was what's really sad as um, PBS was having a series uh, last week, I believe, on the um, uh, uh, the tragedy in Yemen with the civil war. Yeah. And they they were showing what the uh, food for the uh, food for the poor or whatever mm-hmm. was was sending into them. And ev- they were getting like a third of a pound of sugar mm-hmm. <laughs> as one. They had three things. They had flour and sugar and I forget what else. You know, if that's what we're sending them, they're still doing it. Yeah. You know? Oh, it's going to take such a long time when you see things like that. And you go, oh, my gosh. You know, it's yeah, it's a whole different world out there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Paul, you and I have reached an hour on this, and okay. mm-hmm. and I, I I I know there's going to be people listening to the last second of this because you're you're interesting to talk to. I would like to reserve the right to call you back. I really enjoy talking to you. Uh, you're yeah. so, you're thoughtful. Uh, we have mm-hmm. more of your life to explore relative to the ketogenic diet, and um, you know you I, I don't know if you know this. Maybe you know it and it's sort of obvious, but you're not the kind of mm-hmm. person that's ever affected by it. At least that's how I see it. Is that uh, you do influence people in a positive way, uh, both the blog and the Facebook group. So it's a voice calling back to you by saying, uh, good work, it's work that is actually affecting. Uh, and mm-hmm. I'm sure there's, I mean, you get uh, a good vibe in your Facebook group, so you know that. But mm-hmm. uh, it's, your comments are important, and mm-hmm. uh, your writing is thoughtful. And uh, hey, Thanks, Carl. I appreciate it. And it's uh, nice to talk to you. Uh, uh, fellow medical professional, and I look forward to doing it again down the road. You bet we will. Okay, okay take, Carl. Take, take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Thanks for listening. For anybody who has any questions, feel free to contact me on our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Same name as our podcast. I'm open to any questions, and we plod through the good and the bad, the difficult and the easy, week after week. <laughs>